Hardly any piece of misinformation about gender dysphoria and gender nonconformity in general is spread more often than claims like the following. Why do you think there's been a rise in transgender identification? And as you answer this, one of the responses people will give, and I've heard and tried to think about, is, well, maybe there's a rise in identification because finally there's cultural space for people to come out and identify as who they truly are. Yeah, it is a complicated matter, but according to Abigail Schreier, who wrote the seminal book, uh, Irresistible Damage, how the transgender craze is seducing our daughters, she points out that, you know, a decade or so ago, gender dysphoria uh, was a condition that affected about one out of every 10,000 men. So men who thought that they were really women. But in the past decade or so, there's been almost a 5,000% increase of actually young girls claiming that they are boys. Mm. And uh, it, according to her, and it seems to make sense, this is a social media contagion, Sean. This, is, this mm. has passed almost entirely through the growth of social media. And uh, she points out as well that there are other factors involved. Um, in addition to social media, what, what do young people want more than anything? They just want to fit in, right? When, when you're a young person, mm. you're a young teenager, you want to fit in. You want to be on the in group. What's I'm the still, fastest way to I'm fit in? I'm still young, Frank, just for the record, but keep going. <laughs> what's, the, what's the fastest and easiest way to fit in in today's social media culture is to claim you're trans because everybody will applaud. Anybody who says this is dangerous, don't go down this road, is going to be canceled or declared some kind of bigot. And it's also another way, because, you know, we were teenagers, Sean. You always wanted to stick it to your parents every now and then, right? That's a good, <laughs> that's a good way of doing it is to, is to claim you're trans. So this has been almost entirely fueled by uh, the ubiquity of social media. I'm with you. What's interesting is there's always been a segment of the population, always at least going back, you know, a century or so, that have genuine gender dysphoria. But this rapid onset gender dysphoria is emerging primarily in adolescent girls without any history of gender dysphoria. Exactly. That tells me there's some type of social contagion taking place here. So we've got three major claims to respond to here. Rapid onset gender dysphoria exists. It's a growing social contagion among AFAB people, and transitioning is incentivized by an overwhelmingly positive social response. Luckily, scientists and physicians have investigated these claims, and their research is publicly available. So let's see what they've found. We'll look at this study out of Sweden first. In its literature review, it covers previous research on the demographics of transgender people. Most studies on the prevalence of the transgender population examine differences by sex assigned at birth. Many have found a higher proportion of transgender women, this means people assigned male at birth, than transgender men, but the numbers have become more similar during the 2010s, particularly among younger generations. The gender difference is affected by how the population is measured. Indicative evidence suggests that transgender women are more likely to receive diagnoses and gender-affirming medical care than transgender men, while the ratios are more even in studies that rely on self-identification and include gender non-conforming or non-binary identities. So, have we seen the number of AFAB people identifying as trans and non-binary grow in the last decade? Yes, but really only to the degree where the number has finally caught up to that of people who are assigned male at birth. When the authors of this study analyzed the administrative data covering all residents of Sweden from 1973 to 2020, they found the following. While the rates increase over time for all age groups, the upward trend is starkest for transgender men aged 15 to 19. The increase for this group was particularly rapid from 2013 to 2016, but subsequently slowed down and reversed after 2018. For transgender women, we find an increase in younger age groups through 2014, but the rates are quite stable thereafter. The researchers analyzed their data to see if COVID-19-related factors accounted for the recent plateau in these rates, but they found that they did not. Figure S1 in the supplementary material shows that the reversal in diagnosis rates began before the pandemic, with the largest decline in the second half of 2019, and mostly affected transgender men in younger age groups. We conclude that these shifting rates are unrelated to COVID-19 and reflect other processes that have primarily affected the transition rates of younger transgender men. So yes, in Sweden there has been growth in the number of young people transitioning, but the rate has either steeply declined or plateaued, depending on demographic factors, in the last several years. 
This is not consistent with the hypothesis of a recent social contagion disproportionately affecting one sex. Interestingly, it does actually compare relatively well to that graph which LGBT allies like to bring up, where left-handedness dramatically increased as stigma decreased and then plateaued. But of course, I still have a lot more to cover. A 2022 study in the Journal of American Pediatrics looked into this subject in the United States, surveying a large number of adolescents in 2017 and 2019. A couple of initialisms you should know as I read this. TGD means transgender and gender diverse, AMAB means assigned male at birth, and AFAB means assigned female at birth. Turns out these are not just ideological insider lingo. These are actually very useful terms in actual medical research, which is why a lot of people use them now. The discussion section reads as follows. Using a national sample of United States adolescents, we found that there were more TGD AMAB adolescents than TGD AFAB adolescents in both 2017 and 2019. Additionally, the total percentage of TGD adolescents in our sample decreased from 2.4% in 2017 to 1.6% 1 in 2019. This decrease in the overall percentage of adolescents identifying as TGD is incongruent with a rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis that posits social contagion. The AMAB-AFAB ratio, still in favor of more TGD-AMAB participants for both years, shifted slightly toward TGD-AFAB participants from 2017 to 2019. Importantly, this change was due to a reduction in the number of TGD-AMAB participants rather than an increase in TGD-AFAB participants, again arguing against a notion of social contagion with unique susceptibility among AFAB youth. Moreover, we found that TGD youth were more likely to be victims of bullying and to have attempted suicide when compared with cisgender youth, which is consistent with past studies. Our additional analyses reveal that TGD youth experience significantly higher rates of bullying than cisgender sexual minority youth, who themselves experience significantly higher rates of bullying when compared with cisgender heterosexual youth. These exceptionally high rates of bullying among TGD youth are inconsistent with the notion that young people come out as TGD either to avoid sexual minority stigma or because being TGD will make them more popular among their peers, both of which are explanations that have recently been propagated in the media. As if that wasn't bad enough for Sean and Frank's claims, there's still more research that debunks them. In the Journal of Pediatrics, we find a 2021 study directly investigating the notion of the supposedly contagious rapid onset gender dysphoria. If the rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis indeed characterizes a distinct clinical phenomenon and these youth access referrals to hormone suppression or gender affirming hormones, then we would expect to see differentiation within clinical samples between those with more recent or rapid onset versus more remote knowledge regarding their gender. Based on the published hypotheses, we would expect more recent gender knowledge to be associated with self-reported mental health measures, mental health and neurodevelopmental disability diagnoses, behaviors consistent with maladaptive coping, e.g. self-harm, support from online and or transgender friends but not parents, and lesser gender dysphoria. We aim to test these hypotheses. And what did they find? We did not find support within a clinical population for a new etiological phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria during adolescence. Among adolescents under age 16 years seen in specialized gender clinics, associations between more recent gender knowledge and factors hypothesized to be involved in rapid onset gender dysphoria were either not statistically significant or were in the opposite direction to what would be hypothesized. So the data did not support the ROGD hypothesis. Check out what the authors say next. This putative phenomenon, ROGD, was posited based on survey data from a convenient sample of parents recruited from websites and may represent the perceptions or experiences of those parents rather than of adolescents, particularly those who may enter into clinical care. Yeah, what proponents of the rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis rarely mention or perhaps don't even know, is that the study that proposed the idea never directly assessed any trans individuals in the first place. Author Lisa Littman surveyed parents of gender nonconforming adolescents on their children's development of gender dysphoria and social influences. She recruited these parents using websites Fourth Wave Now, Transgender Trend, and Youth Trans Critical Professionals, 
which are groups where participants already believe that being trans is a social trend and advocate for legislation against access to trans healthcare. Basically, this study just established that 256 parents perceived their child's gender dysphoria to be little more than a trend. This does not give any kind of clinical or scientific validity to the notion that rapid onset gender dysphoria exists, much less explains the previously growing numbers of people identifying as trans or non-binary. This study has been extremely heavily criticized by researchers in this field, so much that the American Psychological Association and 61 other healthcare providers organizations signed a letter in 2021 denouncing the validity of rapid onset gender dysphoria as a clinical diagnosis. To put the final nail in the coffin for the claim that people claim to be trans for positive attention, remember that this study found exceptionally high rates of bullying among TGD youth. Additionally, transgender people are over four times more likely than cisgender people to be victims of violent crime, according to the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law. This directly contradicts the trans for positive attention narrative. I think it's more than reasonable to conclude then that our pals Sean and Frank do not actually understand the subject they're speaking on in that clip and are flatly wrong. But still, claims like theirs are influential even on powerful people who use the myth of rapid onset gender dysphoria to argue that transgender and gender nonconforming identities are undeserving of recognition and therefore protections under the law. This results in too many cases in their rights to public spaces, safety, accurate legal identification, and health care being stripped away. Being LGBTQ is not contagious. It is not a fad. It is not a threat. It is an innate characteristic of some people which should not serve as a basis for discrimination any more than skin color or sex. So, next time you hear someone voice the rapid onset gender dysphoria myth, ask them if they know about the 62 major healthcare providers organizations which reject it. Or you can send them this video. Thanks for watching. This video is just one part of a much longer video where I dispel several popular myths about LGBT psychology and healthcare. If you'd like to check that out, it's linked in the description. And of course, until next time, everyone, stay skeptical.